Now that I've sold you all on Bayesian statistics, you might be interested in trying this all out yourself in R. I'll give you a little bit of exposure to it, but I want to temper your expectations. Bayesian statistics is a developing field, and unlike conventional parametric statistics, we've not yet had 120 years to settle on conventions for interpretation. I know they're out there, but I've not yet read a single paper that used a Bayesian approach. A proper treatment of the subject would probably demand its own course and not just one lecture week. When I last checked, no such course was offered at UB, so in the meantime, you might try to roll your own course using R and a well-written book or blog. The first such textbook I came across is called Bayesian Computation with R, written by the fellow who wrote the Learn Bayes package that accompanies the textbook. Presumably, the package includes all the relevant functions and sample data sets that go with the textbook, which you can find at the link shown here. A second resource I found is available as an ebook in UB's library system. It too has an R package written to accompany the text. However, the author has also posted some instructional videos to YouTube that might be very helpful. I surely don't have the time to go through a textbook worth of material in the time remaining. However, I came across an electronic textbook, Learning Statistics with R, which was released under the Creative Commons license, so it's free. After going through all the standard t-test and ANOVA designs we've already covered, the author concludes with a chapter on Bayesian statistics. She uses functions provided by the Bayes factor package. I'm going to try out these functions to see how they compare to our standard ANOVA. I'll begin by an analysis of some data we should be well familiar with. I'm going to read in our week 4 data, which had three repeated measures per person, taken to ensure measurement stability, rather than to use repetition as a factor. So the first thing I'll do is convert the sub, cond, and rep columns to factors. I learned this L apply trick this week to save time, and I put those lines in green if you want to use this trick yourself. I'm using the aggregate function to compute the mean score for subjects by condition, though each subject was in only one condition. I'll save these collapsed scores to a new data frame, df sum, which will look like the table on the right. This should look pretty familiar to you all, and is how we would have analyzed these same data back in week 4 with the standard ANOVA. The f of 8.52 was significant at p of less than 0 0.005, which is a pretty solid result. Now we will use the Bayes factor ANOVA from the Bayes factor package to run a Bayesian analysis of the same data. I'm not providing any priors to the model, which implies that the model will use uninformative priors by default. The progress bar is generated in the blink of an eye, and I think is indicating the progress of a Monte Carlo simulation. I am saving my modeling results to the w 4 Bayes data object. The important information is in the results of the Bayes factor analysis. When I explore the model contents, I see the odds are 9.5 to 1 in favor of the alternative hypothesis. That is, at least that one pair of condition means differs. We would take that as positive evidence for our experimental effect. So what else can we use the Bayesian approach for? A null hypothesis test is set up to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. If you ever TA an undergraduate stats course, you will find many students compute a non-significant statistic and say that they accept the null. However, accepting the null is not one of the available options. It could be argued that the non-significant statistic is because the effect is small and that the study was underpowered. But what if you're trying to show no difference exists between groups, as might be the case if you're trying to match your samples, or to disprove a theory? A null hypothesis significance test won't help you here. However, if a Bayes factor greater than 1 is interpreted as the odds in favor of the alternative hypothesis, a Bayes factor of less than 1 can be interpreted as the odds in favor of the null hypothesis. Let's try this out on some fabricated data. 
I'll use a factorial design just to show you the syntax for Bayesian ANOVA on more complicated designs. I've generated some fake IQ scores for 12 participants in each of four conditions from a 2x2 two two factorial design. No systematic differences were built into the random IQ scores because all scores were generated by the Excel function shown in red. So we know the null hypothesis to be true. Each score is randomly drawn from a normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. That said, it is unlikely that all condition means are exactly identical, and in fact it turns out that the easy ANOVA analysis reports a significant interaction, p equals 0.01. Let's see what the Bayes factor ANOVA says about it. I will specify a model where the dependent variable, dv, is a function of a and or b, and that a and b may interact. ANOVA BF will check out models with just a, just b, both a and b but no interaction, and with a and b and their interaction. Because the a-b interaction implies both a and b, you get all those possibilities for free just by specifying the a-b interaction as I've shown in green. This is all made up data, so I have no priors to specify. The model will use uninformative priors by default. All the possible models were tested out, with Bayes factors reported for each of them. Remember, the conventional ANOVA found a significant interaction, and at p equals 0.01, it was well past the 0.05 threshold. The reported Bayes factors tell a much different story. The strongest of the Bayes factors was found in the fourth model that included a, b, and their interaction, at 0.37. Remember, these values report the ratio of evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So even in the best case scenario, using the model including the interaction, the evidence does not support the alternative hypothesis. However, we can flip this around. Because the Bayes factor expresses a ratio in favor of the alternative hypothesis, the inverse is the ratio in favor of the null hypothesis. Thus, the available evidence is 2.68 to 1 in favor of the null hypothesis. Granted, that still amounts to negligible evidence, but considering that the standard ANOVA might have been interpreted as clearly in favor of the alternative hypothesis, this is a remarkable turn of events, and provides you with a possible strategy should you ever need to somehow provide evidence for the null hypothesis. This is where I can tie a bunch of things together. Remember, when you peek at the data, that's a problem. So a conventional ANOVA doesn't let you just append new data you've collected and reanalyze the larger data set. In fact, you can't use the old data at all. But in a Bayesian analysis, the old results can be used as priors. Now, I would have no reason to think that randomly generated IQ scores assigned randomly in a factorial design should differ at all between the groups. And yet, the ANOVA showed a significant interaction and the first Bayesian ANOVA showed only negligible evidence supporting the null hypothesis. I'm going to replicate the study with a new data set generated in the same manner. The follow-up analysis will use the first analysis as priors. Under the conventional paradigm, middling effects might suggest an underpowered study that requires a follow-up with even larger end size. The first study used 48 participants. However, I plan to follow up with only 24. Because the first study provides priors, I'm able to reuse these data in a way that conventional ANOVAs could not, at least not without inflating my type 1 error rate as I demonstrated earlier. Looking only at my 24 new participants randomly sampled from the same population, my Bayes ANOVA now tells me that the best model finds negligible evidence for a model including only factor B. A conventional ANOVA on the same data shows a significant main effect for B. So the mean IQ scores differ for the two levels of factor B, which we know to be because of random chance. Let's see what happens when we include our priors and compute our posterior odds. Our PPI data object indicates that it contains posterior odds and the estimated odds have reconciled the results of the two analyses. The first analysis found no evidence supporting any of the models. 
The second found evidence for a model including factor B. However, the balance of the evidence between the two studies indicates that none of the models have sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Had we relied on the ANOVA results, we would have to puzzle out why we found a significant AB interaction in the first study and a significant effect of B in the second study. If this were a real-life line of research using conventional factorial ANOVAs, we might find ourselves correctly inferring that there is no effect of A, but possibly running follow-up studies to explore a hunch that A might be moderating an effect of B through an interaction. We would not have the benefit of knowing that these are all type 1 errors and that we're on a wild goose chase.